I just press join with audio. Yeah, join audio. Mm-hmm. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you again for joining us uh, today. We are wonderfully happy and uh, thankfully blessed to have uh, two great panelists with us today. Uh, we're going to be speaking about the COVID rollout and the, um, how it affects the communities of color. Um, for now, just a few um, housekeeping uh, events. Any questions that anyone has, please, uh, put them in the chat box. We will address those at the end of the uh, presentations. Um, I was going to go over a little bit of uh, new information regarding NASI and their reorganization, but I will uh, save that for later for the sake of time. I want, I'm anxiously myself uh, want to get to the presentations. So first, let me introduce um, Dr. David Kunz, MD, MBA, FACP. He is the co-chief academic officer and vice president for academic diversity at Hackensack Meridian Health and a professor of medicine and founding associate dean for diversity and equity at the Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine. A practicing general internist at Jersey Shore University Medical Center, Dr. Kunz's research and educational interests include pipeline programs for students underrepresented in medicine, the impact of social determinants on health outcomes, leadership development, and hypertension and related disorders in underserved, underserved populations. Dr. Kunz is the immediate past chair of the steering committee of the Group of Resident Affairs at the Association of American Medical Colleges and co-chair of the National Minority Cardiovascular Alliance, a not-for-profit dedicated to improving minority cardiovascular health. He also serves as co-chair of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Forum of the Leadership Institute. Dr. Kutz is a member of the Mass Educated Guild at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and is the 2019 recipient of, of the Versace M. Mason Community Service Leader Award for the Edward J. III Excellence in Medicine Foundation. Dr. Kunz, thank you for joining us this evening. I will um, share our screen. Okay, well, thank you for uh, inviting me. It's an honor to be on the panel with Dr. Beverly, and uh, my mother would be very happy you read that introduction just the way she would want you to. So, <laughs> but I'm just Dr. David, and kind of an internist, and like all of you, care very much about uh, how we're doing, and and uh, wanted to take a reflective look at how we're doing and where we're going. And so, my 12 or 15 minutes are going to be just a level set where I see things. Uh, with some statistics really around New Jersey, but I think they're pretty uh, comparable to other parts of the country. And I think that my bottom line is there are both bright skies and dark arous dark, uh, dark clouds on the horizon. Uh, first slide, please. Sorry, one second. It is not moving. Sorry about that. That's all right. You can just start going forward and you can just go backwards. Am I going forwards or backwards? You're going forwards. So I need to go backwards. I'm still going forward? Yes. Perfect. Got it. Just, yep. So just the, the next one, please. Perfect. Thank you. So these are some statistics on the uh, New Jersey. Uh, COVID website as of this morning. Uh, we are about 22nd in the country in terms of our overall population uh, getting vaccinated, both first and second dose. Uh, like most places, our rate of vaccination has picked up uh, significantly in the last few weeks. Um, what you'll notice on the bottom of this slide is the 
a percentage of uh, Black and Hispanic Latinx individuals is, remains very low. Uh, in New Jersey, we have about 13% of our population is African-American, about 20, 21% is Latinx. So we are falling well short in those two categories. We'll talk about uh, why that is. Uh, we have had, a, had about a 50-50 distribution of Moderna and Pfizer, but over time, as we introduce uh, Janssen, that will, uh, that will increase and the other two will drop down a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. So in New Jersey, we had uh, a, a major increase in groups that were eligible to sign up for vaccination on Monday. Uh, probably the, the group that has received the most publicity are our teachers. And so they were able to start sign up our pre-K to, to 12 uh, teachers. I'm gonna talk a little later about uh, very high risk individuals in our communities, those in shelters and who are homeless. Uh, and then later this month, we're gonna have a, a larger group of uh, really frontline uh, individuals who will also uh, include a relatively large number of, of underrepresented minority individuals who um, work in food production, agriculture, food distribution. And so this is, that's very encouraging to me that that group will be able to sign up uh, later this month. Of course, the word sign up evokes its own set of challenges for many in our communities. Uh, you need access to a computer. You generally need to be available during the day. If you're elderly, you, you may need a teenager, adult, a son or daughter to help you with that process. So uh, in many places, we've sadly realized that even the sign-up process is, uh, is not as supportive of, of equity as much as we would like. Uh, next slide, please. Vaccination works. I mean, I think this is also an important message. Uh, the country where we've learned the most in the last three months has been Israel. And you can see the positive, meaning the, the, the bars below the dark line in the middle there, many fewer confirmed cases, especially in the high-risk group of elderly, uh, many fewer hospitalizations, and much less serious illness. So I think it's an important message for all of us when we hear concerns about hesitancy to unequivocally be able to share that uh, vaccination in our communities will reduce the disease burden. And, uh, and that's very positive. I work in a 600 bed hospital. I have taken care of COVID patients last spring and this fall. And I serve as the observer in our vaccination village from time to time. We have somewhat leveled out the number of patients we have. It was dropping steadily. But in the last uh, few weeks, it's been steady at around 60 inpatients. Uh, this may represent the variants that you've heard about, uh, but it reminds me that you know it's it's not completely going away by any stretch. I will say, and this is more anecdotal, the patients we're admitting today are younger. They're not being going into the ICU. They're not staying as long. They're not necessarily going on ventilators, but there's still a lot of the infection in many communities. Uh, next slide. So the, the data I showed you with New Jersey has been seen around the country that uh, Hispanic, Latinx, uh, Latinx, and Black uh, individuals are much have been much less likely to re, uh, to be vaccinated. So this is not a New Jersey phenomena; it's uh, unfortunately a national uh, phenomena. Next slide. Uh, this is some more data uh, that we need to correct in our state. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, our total. Hispanic, uh, Black populations, about 34%, and about 10% of the population uh, has been vaccinated. I mentioned I, I spend time as an observer in this vaccination village in our hospital, and we are right on the border of a community like Asbury Park. Some of you know Neptune, uh, fairly good underrepresented uh, populations. Very few of those individuals seem to be coming in to take advantage of vaccination. Uh, so we really need to make sure we have strategies to get and go to them. Next slide. These were the tenants of our program in New Jersey. This is from a executive plan that's on the website from several months ago to provide equitable access, to achieve community protection, and to build uh, sustainable trust. And, uh, and there are, are a bunch of uh, measures below that you can see. Uh, to achieve those goals. And again, I think you could argue that we, we are doing um, 
we're trying in our state, but like many states, we are not yet provided the type of equitable access that we had hoped for. Next slide. So this is also from today. This is from the uh, Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report from the Centers for Disease Control and, Preven uh, and Prevention. And so one strategy that many states have, have tried to use to ensure that equitable distribution is using something called a social vulnerability index. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of this. It has a number of indicators into four themes around socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, racial ethnicity, minority status and language, and housing type and transportation. And using those criteria is what has put certain individuals, certain groups, highest in, in terms of being access to the vaccination. I, I didn't put all the pages in the report, but just the bottom line uh, is that in the first two and a half months of vaccine of the program, high socially vulnerable co counties had lower vaccination coverage than the low social vulnerability counties. So despite a, a strong, I think, theoretical st structure for how to, uh, yeah, thank you, on how to roll out the vaccine, it has been, you know, if you have a car and you have a, a child who could get on the phone over and over again and you can get to a mega site, you are more likely to get the vaccine. And, and that's somewhat independent if you're black or white or Latino. Uh, but for those in communities where they don't have access to a car, where they don't have uh, a strong broadband connection, where they have to go out and work during the day and can't take time to get back on um, uh, the internet over and over again, um, those tend to be higher social vulnerability index individuals and they have been less likely to be vaccinated. Next slide. We also know that there's skepticism. Uh, I would really focus on the two slides to the left uh, that you can get the broad picture from these slides from Pew around confidence in treatments offered by uh, conventional medicine. And this is that institutional racism and uh, history of distrust. Uh, there's also lower confidence in scientists and physicians, some of Blacks uh, than whites and, and Hispanic adults. So uh, much of what I've been trying to do in my career is build the pipeline for underrepresented individuals to move into medicine and science. And that remains a, a huge challenge for us. Next slide. Um, the COVID vaccine is not unique. Um, we have had a longer history of anxiety around vaccination in our communities of color. Uh, this is some information from uh, one of the more recent influenza vaccine seasons. Uh, so it's not surprising that even if there was equal access, there's still some anxiety around the concept of vaccination. We've seen it with, uh, with influenza and other, uh, other vaccines as well. Next slide. So many of our community, uh, members of our communities are really taking that wait and see approach. They would be at a uh, pre-contemplative or kind of period where uh, they, um, they, they haven't gotten the vaccine, they're waiting to see, they wanna see more information. So it's really incumbent upon all of us to publicize when individuals in communities are getting vaccinated. Uh, it's important that we take advantage of perhaps in some cases celebrity, in some cases community leaders, in some cases faith leaders, to push those individuals from wait and see to uh, I, I'm willing to get it. Because uh, frankly, one of two things is gonna happen. People are gonna need to get vaccinated or they may, may, may be vulnerable to getting the infection. We will get to herd immunity one way or another through vaccination or through infection. Next slide. So uh, for those of us who advise a, a lot of um, underrepresented people in communities of color, uh, you know, key points that I remind my team, uh, very basic, I'm sure all of you would say these things as well. Uh, you can't get um, sick with the COVID infection from getting the vaccination. Uh, you will not test positive on a COVID viral test, although you will develop antibodies if you take an antibody test. Um, and you can help your community. You can go visit your grandparents. You, or if you live in a multi-generational household, you can keep other people healthy. So important to get comp, you know, these common messages out 
and repeat them over and over. Next slide. Um, and so my opportunity to talk with all of you is one of the key tactics recommended by the CDC, really for both of us, engage local and national professional associations. Uh, I believe all of you have an enormous opportunity to be another voice to provide reassurance and confidence. And it can't only be by physicians and scientists. Frankly, we know that there's still a lot of mistrust. So uh, other uh, individuals who have connections to the community are critical to promote confidence. Uh, next slide. Uh, and I won't, I won't go over this. We've kind of made this point over and over again. Know the elements of effective vaccination conversations. Uh, and be proactive, explaining. And, and I am also hope I'm a good listener. I mean, I understand loud and clear some of the issues that have led to mistrust. It's not about trying to minimize them. It's to acknowledge them and talk about how we're all committed to doing better going forward. Uh, next slide. So, you know, there are many populations that we've talked about, but a, an important subpopulation that is uh, largely made up of communities of color are individuals in homeless shelters and uh, domestic uh, violence shelters. And, uh, and again, this is a very high population of individuals who identify as black and homeless, those who are homeless. Uh, they, I think this is probably a low percentage of 50% with at least one other medical condition. I would imagine it's much higher. In our state, uh, these uh, individuals seem to be you know, primarily in Essex, Hudson and Burlington counties. Uh, the sites of vaccination, which started about two weeks ago are, are federally qualified health centers, local health departments, outreach through mobile vans, and this may be where there's very good role for the one dose Janssen vaccine. Uh, yes, I understand that the head to head comparison with the other vaccines is lower. Even that is a little questionable because the timing of the studies is different than when the Moderna and the uh, Pfizer vaccines were studied. But if you think about some of the challenges with trying to follow up with someone who's homeless or coming in and out of a shelter, uh, I, I think if I were given a choice between one approved vaccine uh, versus trying to track people down, uh, given the struggles that they're dealing with, this is uh, a, better, a better place, I believe, uh, for the uh, Janssen vaccine so we can feel confident that these individuals who are in a high risk group are fully vaccinated. Uh, next slide. This is my last slide, and I mentioned both uh, uh, bright skies, but uh, dark clouds. And one of the dark clouds uh, that we've all heard about, and this may be a dark cloud for everyone, is the potential of these variants. So on the left, also from today's uh, COVID dashboard are, again, a small number, but uh, not an insignificant number of variants which have been tested in different counties in our state. And the, the curve or the table to the, or the graph, I'm sorry, to the right, is what's happening in Brazil, where in Brazil and in parts of Europe and other places, there is a, a real increase in the need for lockdowns. And, and so if these variants make it into the US in a large percentage, large number, it will really be uh, significant for communities of color. The other thing that is just potentially gonna happen is we have a rush to vaccination. So if you have a choice, between vaccinating 4,000 people a day in a mega center or 300 people in a high rise apartment uh, because these are communities of color where people can't easily get out, you know, we have to still make sure that our resources are equally divided. Uh, there will be a, a natural push to just vaccine more and more and more people because we do have to get to that high vaccine percentage, but we can't do that. We can't race against the potential of variants and leave behind communities of color. So I'll stop there and we'll be delighted to take questions uh, after Dr. Beverly. Thank you for, uh, uh, for inviting me. Thank you, that was uh, definitely very, very interesting, very informative. Um, again, we want to keep the, uh, the ball rolling. And again, if anyone has any questions, please uh, submit them into the chat box. And we will uh, address them once we are finished with our second 
our panelists, which is uh, Dr. Maureen Beverly, an executive level physician with 20 years of experience advocating for improving the patient's engagement and cultural competence for all populations, especially the geriatric, immigrant, and African American communities. As an AVP physician advisor for New York City Health and Hospitals, she sponsored the first conference on improving the health of the elderly Black population. She implemented the concept of the bridge team whose role was to bridge the gap in care for the most complicated and vulnerable population. And as a result, improve care and health outcomes. As deputy executive director of Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, her team decreased congestive heart failure readmission from 30% to 18.7% in less than two years. Dr. Beverly is a fellow at the New York Academy of Medicine and her abstract health disparities and epidemic perception versus reality was selected for presentation at the NYAM 12th Annual History of Medicine and Public Health Night. Dr. Beverly is also a member of the American Medical Association and Medical Society, State of New York, working in collaboration with Westchester County Medical Society, Westchester Academy of Medicine, and Putnam County Medical Society in developing patient engagement and cultural competence training programs with CME credits. Dr. Beverly received her bachelor's from Boston University and MD from the University of Buffalo School of Medicine. She completed her internship and residency in internal medicine at Harlem Hospital, New York, Columbia Presbyterian. She's president of Maureen, Maureen Beverly MD PLC, patient engagement and cultural competence specialist. Welcome, Dr. Beverly. Thank you so much, Wendell. And um, I'm really appreciative of you inviting me to be a speaker on this very important topic. And I'm honored to be on the panel with Dr. Kunz. Uh, that was an amazing presentation and it was so informative. And um, I have a lot to follow now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, thank you again. Um, so I'll be addressing the topic through the lens of um, history of health disparity. I'm gonna give you a couple of statements, patient voices and a bi-directional approach to solving health inequities. And I'm gonna look at the perception versus reality of the African-American population, both historically and also in, currently in the COVID um, um, problem, in the, in, in the COVID environment right now. And we're going to look at uh, recommendations to decrease health disparities related to COVID. Okay, so next slide, please. So just a history of health disparities. Harriet Washington's critically acclaimed book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans, traces the experimentation going back to the middle of the 18th century, culminating with the, with the telling of the infamous Tuskegee experiment in which African-Americans suffering from syphilis were denied an, avail an, an available cure in order to trace the course of the disease. Another best-selling author, um, Dr. I'm sorry, attorney Matthews, her book, Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequality in African-American Health, um, she proposed that the cure for racial and ethnic discrimination in, Africa, in the American health here lies in reform in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Add to this more books and numerous scholarly articles retaining historical, uh, I'm sorry, detailing historical racial accounts and the need for policy changes, all of which paints a very compelling picture. The, the absence, however, is the absence of the individual human value. It eliminates or diminishes the need for patient engagement. Resolving the absence can lead to better health outcomes for African-Americans of all socioeconomic status. Next. So just uh, want to just bring in, um, you know, the patient voices. I'm very um, just humbled by speaking to a lot of patients, particularly the elderly black population. Um, and when a patient says, an elderly black African-American, I picked cotton in the South and I paid my dues. I don't deserve to be treated this way. These powerful quotes are saying, do you know me, my historical background, my pain and my suffering? Do you possess the level of cultural competence to understand who I am and what is important to me? How are you going to express empathy and engage me in order to improve my health? 
and another elderly African-American states, all I want when I come to a hospital is for someone to be nice to me. And if that's what all a person wants when they come to a hospital, and if hospital systems cannot deliver that, then we really have some uh, serious problems um, to solve. Next. So I, I think um, patient engagement and cultural competence, I think ha there has to be a bi-directional approach to begin to think about solving the problem. So our medical graduates, our medical our doctors, they are from different parts of the country, different parts of the world. And I think we need to be able to have a bi-directional approach, foreign medical graduates to American patients, American-born physicians to foreign-born patients, and American-born physicians to American-born patients who are different than themselves. If we know who the individual is as opposed to one's perception of the individual, then there will be an improved patient engagement and as a result, better health outcomes. If one's perception is the same as the reality, then there is an opportunity to make needed changes. But if one's perception is different than the reality, we run the risk of increasing disparities in care and poor health outcomes. Next. So I think in certain circumstances, solutions can be simple as they are complex. And I would recommend to health systems, the required first step is to, de to in decrease in health inequities is to increase human value. It is important to recognize and address the role of cultural competency for all population. And in my opinion, currently, the English speaking population is left out of the conversation. Those patient voices, which I referenced before, they are not a part of the cultural competence conversation. And they really should be, and all population needs to be part of the cultural competence conversation. Okay, next. So I wanna look at now, as I mentioned, the perception versus reality, particularly in related to COVID. Okay, so what is the perception and what is the reality? Next slide. So the COVID pandemic has shed a bright light on the long-standing numerous health inequities experienced by Black Americans across the U.S. The Black population has the highest COVID death rates. The perception is that the prevailing thought is that as a result of poverty, lack of access to care, social determinants of health and comorbidities is why um, Black people are dying at a higher rate. So when you look at it from that perspective, so there's a lower socioeconomic group that they are attributing to all Blacks, regardless of socioeconomic status. Is that social determinants of health and lack of access to care important? Absolutely. But let's look at the reality from a broader scope. So for example, in Prince George County, Maryland, one of the wealthiest Black upper class communities in the nation had some of the highest COVID mortalities. Brooklyn, New York, with a large Black population, 13 hospitals, inclusive of three public hospitals, one state hospital, and extensive public transportation that runs throughout black and white Brooklyn, and they have the highest COVID death rates in New York City. Public transportation employees who died, on the, uh, who died uh, from COVID were predominantly black. They're union workers. They're, the average salary, I'm told, is about $50,000 with pension plans and health coverage. And so here's a quote, very interesting, from Tan Tangela Purnell, Associate Director of Johns Hopkins Center for Health and Equity. You know, we still see stark racial differences even at a high income level. People say, oh my, my oh, oh, minorities are dying because they are poor. We know that's not the case. And the reason I think it's important to look at the reality and to realize that COVID is affecting Blacks across all socioeconomic status. And if we limit it to just social determinants of health and access to care, we're going to leave out a large majority of the Black population. And the COVID conversation, the COVID response to COVID has to be addressed across all socioeconomic groups. Next. So I thought it would be important, I thought, if we developed a survey against uh, inclusive of all age groups, because another, another you know, very, um, important conversation to have, which everybody thinks that, oh, Blacks are not taking it because of the Tuskegee study. And I totally understand that, and that's absolutely relevant. But is that the same across all age groups? So does the 19-year-old, 
if they're not going to take the COVID, is it due to um, the history of the Tuskegee study? And if I'm 65 years old, am I not going to take it because of COVID? And I think, again, it's important to expand the conversation in the African-American and all populations across all age groups, because a younger age groups who are not taking the vaccine or have concerns may have a different reason why they are. So I thought this survey might be helpful. So I broke it out by age, whether it's 16 to 30, 31 to 50, 51 to 65, 60 to 80, and 85 to 105, because we have had patients in our hospital beds who are over 100 years old. And the racial ethnicity, African-American slash Black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, Caucasian, gender, male or female or LGBTQ um, individuals. And so I thought the questions um, that we would be important to ask is, have you had a lost a family member from COVID? Do you currently or have been diagnosed with COVID? Do you have any of these condi or comorbid conditions, essentially diabetes, lung disease, heart disease, hypertension, sickle cell disease? Nobody speaks about the sickle cell population in this very um, dangerous uh, environment, particularly for, for, for this particular population with sickle cell. You know, and the question is, are you planning to take the COVID vaccine? Yes, no, not sure. Number five, if you are not sure, please explain why. And the reason why I did not have a check box for patients to check or individuals to check is because sometimes if the check box doesn't necessarily address the way the person is actually feeling and they may not fill out that, that check that box at all. So I thought it's important to write down, tell me why. Why or are you not sure that you, you are going to take the vaccine? And if your answer is not sure, yes, who or what information will be able to convince you? Is it going to be your mom, your family member, spouse? Is it going to be um, your doctor, social media, the minister? If you're a part of a sorority group, is the sorority is going to convince you? So it's important for us to know from an age perspective, who is the person or entity that will be able to convince you? Okay, next. And if you're African-American, and so we want to make sure that we, we are get, get it clear and that we, uh, we get it right, are you not taking it? Are you concerned? Is it because of racism in healthcare, the knowledge of Tuskegee, Harriet Lacks experience, history of polio vaccine, or, or other? And if they could write in if there's an other. Identify all, all who have influenced your decision. So as I said, is it family member, spouse, your doctor, friend, social media, TV? And if there's another entity that have influenced you, please specify. What are your fears and what's important to you? I think question nine and 10 are so important because in healthcare, interestingly enough, we don't ask a lot of questions concerning patient fears. And I think it it's would be, it, and, and I've seen it in the hospital, where people are afraid of something or some entity or some reasons why they should not have a have a, a test or have a, a surgery or so forth. And then it's also tied into quote the language of non-compliance. So there's a relationship between fear and non-compliance. And if you don't know what the patient fears are, then you will constantly use the negative like patient is non-compliant, but you don't know who the individual is and what's important. If I know what's important to you, then it's a better position I'm in as a physician or a nurse or social worker to collaborate more with you now that I understand your fears and know that I understand what's important to you. Are you a frontline worker? Are you employed? And what level of education do you have and to have any comments and recommendation? So I think if we're able to apply the survey, let's say for 100 people, and then we broke it out and is there top three things that are similar in all age groups and what are the differences in different age groups, then we'll be able to, um, from my perspective, to make uh, uh, the design uh, a process to address all age groups and the needs and how we could get patients to or individuals to, to agree to that the vaccine is important to them and that they will take it. Okay, next. So hospitalization vaccine protocol. So. It's, I developed this based on a personal experience. Uh, earlier this year, my mother-in-law was hospitalized. She was 92 years old. And thankfully, um, she made it out the hospital. 
And on the day she was discharged, I asked the doctor if he will give her a vaccine, give her a vaccine shot. And he said, they don't do that. And I said, that's interesting. So when I started to research and talk to other um, physicians in different hospitals, and I said, do you give vaccines on, when patients are being discharged? And they said, no. So I said, interesting. So then I thought it would be important to look at it from a health equity perspective as well. So the purpose of the vaccination protocol is to potentially decrease disparities due to increased vaccinations for African-Americans and other minority populations, the disabled, the elderly, and other vulnerable groups starting at age 18. This discharge vaccination process would monitor adverse reaction, decrease the wait time for vaccine appointments, and on st standing in line post discharge as a result of decreased COVID and decreased COVID spread. So if I'm being discharged and I'm elderly and I'm going home, so now I have to get an appointment with my doctor, which may be in a month, and then they're going to have to get an appointment maybe in another um, community um, center to get the vaccine. And, or I could wait online for two, three hours. Whereas if you're in the hospital and you're being discharged, why not give the vaccine? And because, and the, the good news is the hospitals have the vaccines. They give it to staff. So why wouldn't they be able to give it to patients? And so one of the learning objectives would be to provide vaccinations for COVID patients who are being discharged from the hospital to decrease death rates and health inequities due to lack of vaccination for all populations hospitalized, specifically the African American, and to identify and recognize the potential opportunity for African American elderly population who are dying at a higher rate than anyone else. Next. So, and, also, and the protocols would also develop criteria based on CDC guidelines, disease category, age, lack of access to vaccine post-discharge. So if I'm 19 and I have diabetic ketoacidosis and now I'm better and I'm being discharged, why not give that individual a vaccine? You know, because they would fit the criteria um, from a di diagnostic pers uh, perspective. And we want to implement protocols as to which patients would be eligible for the vaccine based on medical condition and health status, data tracking for all patients who receive the vaccine from all clinical departments, be it medicine, surgery, behavioral health, adolescent, develop data monitoring adverse reaction. And what is really, I think, would be very important if you are being discharged, if you, you most people don't get discharged at nine o'clock. So if you give the vaccine at nine o'clock and there's an adverse reaction, what better place to be in to manage the adverse reaction than in a hospital and to develop protocols for single or second dose vaccinations. Next, let's. And the final slide is just memorable quotes. Um, that is embedded in my brain these days is Martin Luther King's speech on Medical Committee for Human Rights in 1966. Of all the hum of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And this quote came from a hematologist uh, in Connecticut, uh, Dr. Zemsky. Difficult patients are not just born. They are in part created by their passage through the medical system. Not only has the system failed to cure, it may have done unpleasant things to make matters worse. And finally, Hippocrates, it's better to know the individual who has the disease than the disease who has the individual. Imagine, imagine Hippocrates knew that um, thousands of years ago, and we are just learning that now. Next, thank you. Questions? So yes, thank you, Dr. Beverly. That was certainly very, very uh, interesting. And, and, and of course, many of the conversations that uh, we've shared and we've also um, spoken about at uh, other uh, oh, other events. Um, so at this time now, what I'd like to do is uh, any, entertain any questions that uh, anyone has had. I'm going to turn it over to L'Oreal, L'Oreal Porter, um, who will conduct the questions or any questions that are read or asked. All right, perfect. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beverly. Thank you, Dr. Koontz. It was very insightful. Um, very informative. So a few questions here. Um, do you think moving forward, we'll experience more collaboration specifically for black and brown individuals who are working class? Do you think it would be, you know, more beneficial if some of these, um, if we take the vaccination site to work? That way, um, we're kind of 
correcting the barrier of, well, I can't get off of work, I can't take the vaccination, or I don't have transportation, do you think it would be more beneficial? Maybe I can start. Uh, first of all, let me say what a terrific uh, presentation it was by Dr. Beverly. Uh, I, uh, I really learned about 10 new things, so thank you for that. Uh, I think the answer, my answer would be yes. And I think it's largely because there'll just be more vaccine available. So I think if, if, if we might not have that seesaw, do we do it A or B, if we have more vaccine available, we'll have the opportunity to take advantage of multiple strategies, such as going to work sites, going into the community, going into high rises. So I think the answer is largely dependent on the availability of vaccination, vaccines in states. Thanks. And Dr. Beverly, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think um, Dr. Kunz uh, said it correctly. You know, I totally agree with him. You know, nothing more to add on that. All right, perfect. So kind of taking a, a bit of a turn, you know, you've both educated us on the, the variants that we're experiencing with COVID. Um, it, within our community, there seems to be this sort of barrier, even with the outreach, even with the education, the resources available. What would be, let's say we were having this conversation a year from now, and we've outreached, we educated, we've provided resources, and it still did not work what would be some of those outcomes? What would that future look like for us? A year from now, I, I think it would be important to, the data, the data would be important. So from today to a year from now, in terms of vaccinations, what percentage of the population, and we could break it out um, as Dr. Kunz had on his, um, on his presentation, a year from now and compare it to now. Because to me, from my perspective, that would be a way for me to analyze what exactly has happened and is happening. Are we going in the right direction? Did we come into gaps? Uh, as things change, as the vaccination process in terms of um, what the various variables come into play four, five, six months from now, and that has changed the course of, of the disease, it's not quite clear. So I would, from my perspective, I would need to be able to follow the data and to see what's, what is changing and, and, and then be able to put them in categories to explain why. Absolutely. So I think that's the very strong scientific answer. I'll give more of the blue sky answer. I think a year from now, things will be better for everybody. I think we will achieve uh, this herd immunity I'm hoping that even if there's some variants, they'll either not be so prevalent or there'll be even new vaccines, just like we change the influenza vaccine every year. I know that sounds crazy because so many people haven't yet had the opportunity to get vaccinated, but in a year, maybe people will be rolling out a second vaccine by one of the companies. I think, however, between now and a year from now, if we don't improve our effectiveness of outreach to communities of color, there'll be a lot more death and disability. Yeah, a year from now, overall, and in some of our uh, underrepresented communities, we'll, we'll achieve some type of herd immunity and things will be better. But between now and then, I worry that there'll be disproportionate, continued disproportional uh, kind of death in communities of color. Perfect, thank you so much. And we do have a few questions coming in from the chat. Uh, this question states, will the Euro wave have an effect on the US populations? I would say undoubtedly. If we've learned one thing in the last year, it's that these variants don't stay in one place their entire time. So I can't even keep up with all the different variants, but if there are uh, variants to the virus that are seen in one place, they will undoubtedly be seen everywhere. And so uh, I think it's a matter of whether the current vaccines are effective. In, and, and when I talk to patients about effectiveness, I don't, I try to move them away from the idea that you can never get the illness. 
I, I really try to say, I mean, you don't want to be in the ICU. Okay? You don't want to die. So if you get sick with it, just like if you get sick with the flu and you're, you're sick for a couple of days, you're getting the influenza vaccination keeps you, is more likely to keep you from getting hospitalized or going into intensive care. And I think that's the theme we should be talking to vaccine hesitant people about. We don't want to be so, you'll never get COVID, but you're much less likely to be hospitalized. Your mom is much less likely to get hospitalized. So uh, that, that I think is, is an important concept to remind people about. Absolutely. And another question here uh, states, should, be, should we be worried about the, the New York variant? I, again, I'll just answer briefly and then ask Dr. Beverly to comment. I, I think we should, you know, one of the challenges with slow vaccination, regardless of where it is, regardless of what population, uh, in the midst of a pandemic with a virus that is mutating is, you know, even what we think of as the New York variant today will be the X variant tomorrow because this thing keeps mutating. So I, I worry about all the variants. And in my county here in New Jersey, we've really, you know, we're still in kind of a orange to red. And I, I wonder if it's because of that variant slide. I live in Ocean County, New Jersey, where we've seen, you know, more variants than many other counties in our state. And then one last question. Um, for those, for myself, um, I work for health insurance and some, some of my colleagues are using uh, herd immunity as, um, I guess, a reason to be hesitant or a reason uh, not to get the vaccine quite at this time. Um, for those who are using herd immunity as their particular reason, um, how far are we from really reaching herd immunity? And, and what would you say to those individuals who are, who are, who are using that as their particular reason? Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Kunz, you're better. You're well, I, I, would, I would say that how far away are we? I mean, I, I think, as I mentioned, I think New Jersey, about 20% of the population has been vaccinated. Maybe 10% more or 20% more has maybe some type of natural immunity, we don't really know. So I think we're months and months and months away. So that's the short answer. And what's gonna happen between now and then? Individuals who are in high risk, socially vulnerable, a piece of which is lower socioeconomic status. But as Dr. Beverly pointed out, this can affect you know minority members who are not in a lower socioeconomic group. This could be a, minority member who is a frontline worker who makes a good salary, excuse me, but drives a bus. So, it, you know, as a group, we are much more likely to be high risk. And that only a piece of that is lower socioeconomic status. So it's a lot of other elements as Dr. Beverly pointed out. So, you know, if we wait for herd immunity, we're just gonna have more disease in our communities and we're gonna have more death in our communities. So you know, that's what I think what yeah. would happen. Perfect. And, and Dr. Beverly, did you have a few words? Uh, no, I, I, I totally agree. You know, um, to me right now, it's about vaccination. It's about vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. Get people, get the community vaccinated. Whether you want to use the J and J, whether you want to use uh, Moderna or Pfizer, it's it's important for us to keep the process, keep, for lack of a better term, keep the emphasis or the pressure on or the concept on getting our patients, our individual, our family members, our community, the African American community, and all other ethnic groups vaccinated, because that's that's our way out. You know, other than that, we're going to run into increased mortality. So I, I just, I, everybody I come in contact with, I ask them, are they going to get vaccinated? You know, and um, there's a group that I, friends of mine, that, that what I call the wait and see group. Okay, let's see what happens. <laughs> you know, let's see what happens. And, but while you're waiting to see what happens, 
then you're going to visit your mom or your grandma. And so you are, in, and I tell you, you're in a position of putting your mom and grandma, if they're not, if you're not vaccinated, at risk, you know. So um, I think a lot of times, sometimes if we kind of personalize it, because I just had a conversation today, and it's, it's, it's mom is in the 80s, and, you know, the family doesn't think she should be vaccinated. They don't want her vaccinated. But then the family members weren't vaccinated. So then I said, if you really don't want your mom for whatever reason, religious reasons or whatever reason, let's hold that. But if you're going to see her, then maybe your family members, your sisters and brothers should get vaccinated before you go visit mom, you know. And, um, and the other thing I, I would say, never leave the elderly out of the decision making if they are mentally capable of doing so. And so please, and I realize that I was told that, don't speak for me. <laughs> and I, okay. And so we have to listen to our elders as well and to see what their, our family members. So that's, that's, that's what I um, I just like to take the opportunity to ask a question as well. One that uh, affects um, my family personally, uh, given the warmer months are coming, uh, of course, my, my family's from the Caribbean, and that's the time when they travel from the Caribbean back here to New York. Um, and f for most of the family members that I speak to, it seems the vaccination is very sporadic depending on what country you're in. Um, but how, or what effect do you think the vaccination passport will have? Is that something that will expand or is it right now just pie in the sky? And secondly, with the warmer months coming out and people traveling more, is there a possibility that we can experience um, a higher infection rate or a, a wave or a, a rise in, in positive um, infections during the summer months? So, so let, me, let me tackle that. It's, first of all, I'm not sure we need to wait for the summer months to see the potential effects of people traveling. We have, we're in spring break season now and it will be interesting to see what happens over the next few weeks uh, with the college students who have come back from, maybe not from the Caribbean, but Florida and Texas and Mexico. And we'll see if they, um, uh, if we see a, a resurgence of, of disease. So there'll be a little bit of a natural experiment before we get to the summer months. I, I think that you know one of the advantages of coming to the summer is uh, maybe there's a component of, of being outside, although we did have a spike last summer, but, you know, people, particularly in a multi-generational household, can sit out on a porch or, you know, more easily distance when they couldn't otherwise, it was too cold. That, that might help uh, keep things down a little bit. You know, the vaccine, vaccination passport is probably a, a, a long conversation. I mentioned Israel had you know, one of the things they've done in Israel is they give people this green card or thing on their phone. So some people in society can go to movies and go to restaurants and go to concerts and other people can't. And it has created some real equity issues. Uh, there are people who, for religious reasons, choose not to get vaccinated, but then they are denied access to activities that are publicly funded. So I, I think we will get into certain um, you know, moral issues potentially. I'm just hoping that it'll just be a few more months when you know, things really start to improve. But, but I think that the vaccination passport uh, opens up a, a lot of potential ethical issues. Very good. Um, so at this point, I don't know if anyone has anything else to add, any questions? Um, I want to thank Dr. Kunson and Dr. Beverly for um, enlightening us and certainly I think answering many of the questions that uh, we are faced with. Both of their presentations were, um, as we mentioned before, very informative and I think very helpful, especially for us in, in the healthcare field with the different uh, aspects and uh, individuals that we come across and face. Um, so with, with that, I believe if we don't have any more questions, I would um, like to close the close the um, the session and again thank Dr. Beverly and Dr. Kunz for your time and effort and certainly your information as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody.
Good night. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good evening.